the offering, and if you're sitting at home and would like to join in, it's you know it's very very nice of you to do that. No, we we took the offering. And we're handing out we're handing out little uh, pieces of paper that cover the Bhagavad Gita that we're going to cover today. And what is interesting about this, and what I want to share with you, is you're looking at a document <coughs> whose words emanate from five, six, seven thousand years ago, three, four thousand years before the birth of Jesus Christ. These words flowed out of uh, God knows who, out of the mouth of Krishna, uh, out of the mouth of, 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 of the very creative force that we call God. So if you have this with you, and you have a little Bible with you, we're going to show you the ancient Krishna words, the ancient Hindu words, and we're going to show you their comparative study in the Bible. And uh, let's see what we get. I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, we've titled this Absent from the Body in Om, and uh, let's take a look at it. If you have the, your little sheet, and if you go to the very first one, it's verse 1, and it's, this is Krishna speaking. And he says, Now I will speak briefly of the imperishable goal proclaimed by those versed in the scriptures which the mystic attains when free from passion and for which he is content to undergo the vow of continence. And what I wanted to just share with you is, think again now, you're looking at something that's written 7,000 years ago. You're looking at something that's written thousands of years before the concepts of the Bible as we know it. Thousands of years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And there's two words that I see there, or two phrases that I see there. The one is imperishable, okay, and the other one that is important is versed in scriptures, okay? First in scripture. Those are two things that I wanted to highlight in that very first paragraph. Now I will speak briefly of the imperishable goal, okay? Krishna is speaking of attaining enlightenment, and he's speaking of an imperishable. The word perishable means to die or to spoil. This is a goal that is reachable by every human being sitting in this room, everybody on television, every human being who is alive today can reach this goal. It's the goal that never dies. It's something that is inherent, it is an inherent cause deep within you that you must sit and allow to open itself like a flower blossoms. It's not something that you can do. That's one of the difficult things for a lot of people who get versed in this new age type of stuff or, the, or talking about the teachings of Jesus or talking about Krishna or Buddha. What do I have to do? There's nothing you can do. A rose cannot be opened by a human being. If you open it, it'll die. It has to open when it opens. The grass will grow when it grows. Everything will bloom when it blooms. And the admonition of the Song of Songs is that when you come into your meditation, you don't do anything, you don't see anything, you don't make, use any technique, you simply sit by the side of your beloved until he awakes. And your beloved who awakes is the divine aspect of your inner being. And he will reach over, she will reach over, take you by the hand, and both of you will fly into nirvana, which is the beauty of understanding life. You will understand the secrets of yourself, see, who you really are, what, what your purpose is. See, I hear a lot of people in the New Age who say, oh, I had this experience. I floated around the room where a bright light came in. But what is that going to do for a child who's starving? You know, it's, a, it's, an e it's a part of the same old ego trip that contemporary religion is into. Everybody's having an experience. Well, what is it doing for little children? What's it doing for the animals? What's it doing for, for, for nature? What is it doing for others? But this imperishable goal is to find within yourself the Christ mind, the Christ that emanates from out of you, and it touches the hurt, it touches the oppressed, it touches those who are ill, it touches those who are suffering. Your purpose on this earth is to be a catalyst for the Christ who then will use that which is within you to emanate out to others who are on this earth who have to be healed. That's the beautiful part. That's the imperishable goal. But the second part of it, it says it is open to those versed in scriptures. And a lot of people think they understand scriptures because they read the Bible. And you get further and further away from understanding scriptures when you simply read the Bible. Let me show you what being versed in scriptures is. It's called Wisdom in the book of Proverbs, and it's on page 541. Are there any more Bibles back there? Are they all gone? There's two here. Does anybody want one or would like to use one? Here's one right here. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Page 541 is where I want you to go. I want you to take a look at the book of Proverbs, and let's look at being versed in scriptures. We have a television program in New York and down here, and it's called Hidden Meanings, okay? And it covers the, the, the unveiling, if you would, of allegory and parable, numerology, and so forth and so on, so that when you look at something, you look 
beyond the literal aspect of the word. Have, have any of you ever spoken in hidden meanings? All the time you do. You know, let's go shoot the bull. He's three sheets to the wind. It's green with envy. Right on the nose. What is it? Nutty is a fruitcake. Nutty is a fruitcake. All of these types of things, which, which, but you could think of a hundred of them. You speak that way all the time. It's a hidden meaning. In other words, it does not mean what it says. It has a meaning that is deeply uh, known and ingrained in all of us. So we speak in that language. Now, when you talk about being versed in scriptures, it's important that you understand it the same. Let's look at Proverbs 1. And it says here in verse 2, to know wisdom. I want you to jump, jump down to verse 6. To understand a proverb in the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. There you go. That's understanding being versed in scripture. And Krishna, 7,000 years ago, says this imperishable goal will be proclaimed by those who are versed in scriptures or this imperishable goal will be proclaimed by those who understand the dark sayings. You cannot take one word in any Bible literally. If you do, you've destroyed it. Because what you've done, you've set up a historical thing that you say, I believe this happened. You have no way of knowing. See, the mere fact that you have to believe it leaves it up in question because belief is only something that is, 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 is necessary when proof isn't there. In other words, your foot is in your shoe this morning, I would hope. And, and, and most of you don't have to believe that it's there. How do you know it's there? Because it's a part of you. It's alive. You can feel it. It moves. It throbs at you. And that's what God has to be, a living, real entity. You don't have to believe anything you know. Say. Now, here... Krishna says, the goal is versed in scripture, okay? So let's find out. We, we are not of the East. We are not of, the, of the, the, the Hindu persuasion. We are of the West. We are the Christian persuasion. And there's no difference between the Hindu persuasion and the Christian persuasion, except what people have, have managed to, to, to create. As far as Krishna and Jesus are concerned, they're the same person. There's no difference between them. Did you, know how, did you know how Hare Krishna was born? Did you know that his mother's name was Devaki? And she was a little young girl, a teenager girl, an angel came to her because she looked down and she had something in her tummy and she said, what the heck is this all about? And an angel came down and said, fear not Devaki, for that which is within your womb is the personality of the Godhead and you will give birth and you will call him Hare Krishna. And she gave birth in a cave, and the stars became very auspicious, and the, and the wicked king Kansa set out to kill all the children two years and younger. And the whole thing, it's exactly the same story that you read in the story of the, uh, of the birth of Jesus Christ. But what is the goal? See, what's the goal? And let's use our scripture so that you can be comfortable with it. You say, well, this is Hindu, but what does it say? What is the goal? Let me show you what the goal is. Turn to page 851 in your Bible. And we'll look at Jesus Christ. And the statement of Jesus Christ is in Luke, verse, uh, Luke chapter 17. Okay? And this is the goal. Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Neither Jesus says, shall they say here or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is where? Within you. That's the goal. To find the kingdom of God that is within you. Okay? I, I didn't, oh, excuse me, I didn't use the words of anybody in a new way. I used the words of Jesus Christ who say, this is the goal, the kingdom within you. Think of yourself. Oh, forget the church. Forget the real, all of that stuff's going to come crashing down. It's part of all of what's happening now, all of the traditions. And you're going to be left with yourself, which is the most beautiful temple in the world. And within you is a special power, a special source of creative love, healing power that you have to find and touch. And that's what Jesus said is the kingdom. So what have you been taught? You've been taught you go to school, you read the Bible, you study the scriptures, you go to church, you go to Sunday school. Jesus says nothing, nothing, nothing. Don't do any of that stuff. Jesus says there's something that you have to do. First of all, realize that the kingdom of God is within you. Now this is what you have to do. Go to page 782. Matthew chapter 6, page 782, Matthew chapter 6, okay, and verse 33. And what did Jesus Christ say? I want you to seek first the kingdom of God and the righteousness. And all of the other things that you're concerned about will come. Everything will follow. When you found that which is within you, 
When you touch that holy place within you, that secret cavern of the mind, when you found that, that's the kingdom. And all of the other things which you have been concerned about will come to you. It won't come through a church. It won't come through an evangelist or a preacher or a religion. It won't come from a government. It won't come from a tradition of any kind. It will come when you find that place within yourself, the kingdom of God. And all of the other things will come to you. Now, you say, okay, so that's it. The kingdom is within me, and I've got to seek that first. Forget the Bible, forget church, forget religion. Seek within yourself is what Jesus Christ said to do. And say, well, well how, what's the key to this? Well, how do I do this? Take a look at this. Page 847, Luke chapter 11. Page 847, Luke chapter 11, okay? And let's go to verse 52. Jesus Christ is talking to the lawyers of the day, which are Bible scholars. These were the guys who interpreted the Bible. They interpreted the divine law as it came from the Bible. And this is what Jesus Christ said. Woe unto you lawyers, you have taken away the key of knowledge. Why? You entered not in yourselves. And them that were entering in, you hindered. You told them it was a cult. You told them, oh, you can't do it this way. You've got to follow us. You've got to be part of our religious group. But Jesus Christ says, no, you take away the key of knowledge when you don't enter within yourself. And when you hinder other people, you are preventing them from receiving the key of knowledge and understanding. And the key of knowledge is everything for your children. For the world, I mean, this world we've given, we were given custody of this planet in the middle of this magnificent universe, and we've used it as a dumping ground for atomic bombs and all kinds of violence. We sat by and watched little children starve to death. We incarcerate old people. We abuse animals terribly. We abuse nature itself. We abuse animals to the point where the dolphins even commit suicide, giving themselves up on the beach to make a statement to us, and we don't even understand it. And not only did the dolphins commit suicide, suicide is the second leading killer of teenagers in the United States of America. And what would they say? As we go and we study the dolphins beaching themselves, somebody in another planet would say, something is wrong here, doctor. The humans, there's something wrong. The young are beaching themselves. But, but when I speak to you, oh, this is a cult. You know, stay away from this stuff. For God's sakes, if it is, get involved in it. <coughs> Jesus says wisdom is known by her children and the offspring of what we have done over the past years has been destruction of the planet and destruction of our children and destruction of one another. So this is the mark. This is the prize. This is yours. And it doesn't cost you a penny. It doesn't mean you have to join any church or go anywhere. It is within you and it is waiting for you to stop and discover and for it to come to life. In Philippians 3.1 it says, I press towards the mark. Why don't you go to page 961. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, okay? The, page 961 in the book of Philippians. And the Apostle Paul says, I press towards the mark for the prize of what? The high calling, which is the higher mind, the higher consciousness of God in Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to listen very closely to number 15. Let us, therefore, as many as be, you see Perfect. You see? You say, how can you be perfect? Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. I'm asking every one of you that sit here, every one of you that got the courage to walk down the stairs of this building and come into this room to sit and listen to me, I'm asking every one of you to seek that which is within yourself, which is perfect. And that which is within yourself that is perfect is soiled not by the stain of the thoughts of the lower mind. It sits by itself deep in the caverns and the recesses of your mind, surrounded by that holy wall. Surround it is the Garden of Eden. It is perfect. Where there are no thoughts of the human mind, there is perfection. When you have entered into that, where you have separated from the thoughts of the mind, you have entered into perfection. And there it says, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And it, look what it says. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this to you. You have come here, you have listened to me, you have trusted me. In the years that I've been here, the bizarre things I've told you, I have never told you one thing that I didn't <coughs> confirm in that Bible. Not one. And in all of it, I've asked you simply to do this. Seek for yourself and prove to yourself the existence, especially in this new age, of this magnificent power of love. And if you are otherwise minded, if you will simply open yourself to it, God, the heavenly creator, she will reveal this to you. 
because it is the spirit, which is the feminine principle of God, which activates itself in the minds of human beings. So there's Krishna's imperishable goal, the kingdom within you, versed in the scriptures. And look what it says in verse 80, a chapter, well, page 80, verse 1, which the mystic attains when free from passion. How do you get free from passion? That's hard, isn't it? Free from passion. Really. Not hard. Page 782 in the Bible shows you how to be free from passion. <laughs> well, I guess somebody was going to tell me how to do it. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't necessarily want to, do you? I got a good looking wife, but I want to be free from passion. <laughs> when I get free from passion, you know, I just chuck it in. <laughs> That's right. I mean, well, listen, I didn't create this way of doing things. If this creator, whoever she is, or he is, or what it is, wanted everybody to walk around, he would have made each one repulsive. But he decided to make some of the fellas good looking. How do you do? <laughs> and a lot of the ladies, and they, they stand there like this and so forth. I didn't create people like that. And I like it that way. I think it was a heck of a good creation. Yes, sir, what do you have to say? You know, I'm not going to free myself from passion either. Last week, the impact of your sermon on Samson and Delilah I lost that oh. ponytail. <laughs> so this time I'm not free. <laughs> you mean Delilah? <laughs> you discovered his power and you clipped it at the roots, did you? Oh God, I don't I gotta be careful what we talk about then. Really would. But now you look good. I you know. You know, we, last week we did it with Samson and Delilah, and it came out to be a little thing about Sammy and Dee Dee, you know. <laughs> what was really going on? And she clipped his wings. Anyhow, getting rid of passion in Matthew 6, 25 to 6, 33. How does Jesus say to do it? Take no thought. See, there's, there's not talking about sexual passion. It's not talking about the passion of, of, of watching a show or getting involved in something like you're going to be involved in the Super Bowl. You're going to get It's not talking about that. It's talking about the desire and not desire to have, the desire to be. What is being admonished to you is get rid of the thoughts or the desires that you have to control your destiny. Be willing to get, close all of the parts of your body that bring in that which comes from the outside and say, I will not depend on this one or that one or them or the system. I will depend on that which comes from within the Christ. That's getting rid of passion. That's being free of passion. Okay. Take no thought. And look what it says in verse, chapter 80, verse 1. Yeah, of Krishna, and for which he is content to undergo the vow of continence. Now, a lot of people think that you have to give up sex. Well, forget it. <laughs> that is a ridiculous thing. It is good the day before you meditate to uh, <clears throat> leave a little oil in the lamp. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the day before you meditate, <laughs> the day before you meditate, there should be a little oil in the lamp so the lamp can be lit. But you know what I'm telling you? That is exactly what they were talking about, about the five foolish virgins, virgins and the five wise virgins. There was no oil in the lamp. You've got to leave a little oil. The day before you meditate, now, don't go beyond that too much, you're going to go nuts, but the day before you meditate, a little oil in the lamp so that you can get your lamp lit, you know. Uh, but let me, tell you, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something that happens here. And take this in the, in the way that often, because I saw something on television which is extremely disturbing. And I know you're not allowed to talk about other religions and so forth and so on, but there was a, a program on arts and entertainment. I don't know if you had an opportunity to see it. It's a one-hour show, and it's called The Sins of Our Fathers. And it talks about an investigation that was done, and they had the FBI and all of this stuff. In the Catholic Church, 25 to 40 percent of priests, pedophiles. That's, something's wrong. And under a vow of chastity. And children all over the world, the, the proportions of this is beyond. I mean, any other group or organization that had this going on, you'd have, you'd have, you'd have, you'd have the FBI in there. And, and they found that where a priest abused a child, they, he, he would disappear from the parish, and then they would find him 60, 70 miles away in another one. <clears throat> and, and what they found in, in investigating this is that the reason was because the people in the hierarchy, officials way above, 
are the same problem. It's a very interesting thing. If you look at the <coughs> arts and entertainment, it's called the sins of our fathers. And it's, uh, I know it's something, you, you, but it, it's a very serious thing. And so here, if you try to subdue the natural inner physical passion, you're going to get in trouble. You can't do that. Nobody expects you to do that. How do I know? Let me show you scripture. Page 942 in the Bible. I don't know what channel arts and entertainment is on your television, but you should look at it. It's a very objective, investigative report, and it's very serious. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, page 942, okay? 1 <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. You talk about giving up sex or whatever you're going to give up for the sake of... Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So your physical, physical aspects are not being discussed here. The vow of continence is restraint, self-restraint, meditation, subduing the lower self. And it's very hard for you to do. There's not that many show up here on Tuesday night, and it's hard. You know, because you've got to sit here and you've got to subdue yourself for, for about 30 minutes. And do you know what a challenge that is? Do, do you know what a challenge it is to subdue your mind for 30 seconds? And do you know that that mind has been directing you, and that mind is filled with the junk that's been put into it by those who for years have been trying to structure you along the traditional path? Think this way. And sit down sometime for 30 seconds. Try to think of nothing. When you, when you come down the stairs here, somebody's talking to you. When you go back up the stairs, somebody's talking to you. When you're sitting in the car, not only is somebody talking to you, you're talking back. <laughs> you're having a discussion with a little voice in there. And Jesus Christ says, that's the wicked one downstairs. Come upstairs to the upper room, and I will intercourse with you and place the incorruptible seed. There was a higher mind and there was a lower mind, and we are subjected to the lower mind. So we've got to shut that down through meditation. In, in 80, number two of Krishna, listen to this, that's written 7,000 years ago. Closing the gates of the body, drawing the forces of his mind into the heart, and by the power of meditation, concentrating his vital energy in the brain. Mm. 7,000 years ago. And that's why, that's why Jesus Christ said, take no thought. See, there, there are two aspects of the human mind. There's the carnal mind. A lot of people will say, well, homosexuality is sin, or this is sin, or that is sin, and all of that kind of stuff. Let me show you something. All sexuality, whether it be homosexuality, heterosexuality, whatever it is, I don't know if there's any more than that, but anyhow, for those two, it emanates out of the carnal mind. Okay? Now, let me show you about the carnal mind. So whenever anybody says, that's a sin. It doesn't mean, now, before we get into it, I'm not saying that somebody who forces themselves, that comes under a different code. I'm talking about pure sexual status, if you will, as opposed to performance. Let me show you something about the carnal mind where all sex emanates from, page 924. Okay? Romans chapter 8. Okay? Verse 7. This is the mind that because... The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. You see that? Well, how, can, how can it be a sin if it's not subject to the law? See? What you're talking about here, what you're talking about here is an understanding that you have absolutely no control over the thoughts that impact your mind. It's all from previous life. But you have an opportunity now to rise above that mind, to overcome it, to overcome even the influences of the universe. And that's what I'm begging you to do now, during this inquirious time in the time of Uranus, to get into meditation and rise above the impacts of those electromagnetic fields so that you can flow in the harmony of this change and not be subjected to the difficulty of it. OK. Yes. Okay. So we draw, look at it says in 82, we draw the forces of the higher mind into the center. 
into the heart, and by the power of meditation, concentrating his vital energy in the brain. Now watch me. Did you ever see a Hindu? They have a dot in the center of their head. Symbolizes the single eye, the pineal gland of the brain. Watch me. Go with me now to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Page 781. <coughs> Matthew 6. Many of you have never seen this. Many of you have never known that Jesus Christ said this, okay? Matthew 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, huh? your whole body will fill with light. If you practice the single eye of Krishna, of Jesus, of Buddha, you will fill with enlightenment and understanding. And for the first thing you'll be able to understand is who you are, what your purpose is. I didn't read that from a New Age book. I read it from the Bible of Jesus Christ saying, practice the single eye. And remember what he said before? Seek within yourself for the kingdom of God. Now here we go. Krishna, 83, repeating Om, the symbol of eternity, holding me always in remembrance. He who thus leaves his body and go forth reaches the spirit supreme. I want to read you from the Upanishads. It says, Om, that which is, that which is to be, that which has been, all is Om and only Om. And whatever is beyond time is Om and only Om. All that is immortal, above all immortality. Repeating Om, the symbol of eternity. And look at this, something interesting here. Holding me, the word me. See, means I am. It doesn't mean the individual lower fleshly me. It means the me, that which is the I am, that which is the I, that which is God. In other words, if I say, who is the president of the United States? You give me his name, Bill Clinton. If I say, who is God? Give me his and her name. I am. I am. Oh, wow. I understand. And that's what freaks them out on the highway there. They think they're God. I don't think anything. When I have subdued Bill Donahue into nothingness, all that is left in here is I am. Hmm? Now, the, 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 the name of God, see? Look, let me show you this word, me. Go to page 873, the book of John. John chapter 8, okay? Verse 19. Here's Jesus saying, what? You neither know me. You see that? Nor my Father. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. Bringing me... In. Oh, but you say Jesus is talking about himself. Jesus. Go to, go to page 869. A few pages back. John chapter 5, verse 30. Look what Jesus said. Is Jesus talking about himself when he says, if you knew me, you would know the Father? John chapter 5, verse 30. What does he say? I can of my own self do nothing. The ancients knew I am. The ancients knew me as the imperishable God who dwells within you. So Krishna is repeating, holding to me, now, are you ready to go with this? This is great. Get to he who thus leaves his body. You know what that means? Having an out-of-body experience. I had one. I was sitting in a chair, went into meditation, left the body, and hauled on and came back quick. That, oh, I always said, oh, man, what'd you do that for? If I had only... But the normal thing is to do that. And, and I just wait. I never tried to push it. It just happened because these things that are of God don't happen when you're trying to make them happen. And they don't happen when you're expecting them. They just happen. Hmm? But so this is very Eastern, isn't it? Look what Krishna says. Come on, read it with me. Again. He who thus leaves his body and goes forth reaches the Spirit Supreme. Now let's go to the Bible 
and see page 945 because we've got to get this confirmed in the Bible because this sounds awful Eastern, awful Hindu. I mean, we've got to get this in the Bible because we're not allowed to believe that because these Hindus, you know, they dip in the water and they have funny eyes and everything and <laughs> paint on their heads and Krishna says, he who leaves the body. I want you to read with me 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. <laughs> okay? Good. <sighs> I can feel it. Whoa. Now you say... What about, what about this guy? You see you at 2 Corinthians 5 on page 945. Go a couple more pages. 949. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. This is Paul talking about himself. I know a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Come on. And Krishna says here, what we're reading, he who leaves his body goes forth and reaches the Spirit Supreme. Me, who constantly thinks of me. Look at verse 4, Krishna. To him who thinks constantly of me, that's that inner self, and nothing else to such an ever, ever faithful devotee, O oh, Arjuna, am I ever available, ever accessible. Now this is the beautiful part. To restrain your thoughts so that in meditation you focus on me, the imperishable self, Krishna says, to such an ever faithful devotee, I am ever accessible. If you understand that, that within you, that higher mind, then you realize that you always have access to this. Doesn't make any difference where you are. You know, you can go into the bathroom, run the water, and shout, oh, they don't know. Nobody knows. Do whatever you want. I was in a car, I can go, turn the radio off, and I can go, oh. Oh, you know, I like the, oh, you know, like the booty blues, is, oh, you know, that's good. You can do that. But when you do that, you know what you're doing? You are placing your harmony in direct harmony with the center of the universe. You want to hear it? Do you want to hear home? Be very quiet. I'm going to let you hear it. Take your fingers like this. Come on, it, this is silly, but I mean, so what? What is it going to cost you, anyone? Plug your ears and be very quiet and listen. That noise, you hear it in a boom, 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 boom. If you ever plug your ears and you don't hear that, <laughs> bye, baby. <laughs> that sound, which is the center of you, is the exact same sound that is at the center of the universe. Boom. And that's the sound. And when you make that sound, oh, you are coming right into the center, right into harmony. Hey, folks, I'm talking to you about the guy who created roses and pussycats and dolphins, nice stuff, not bombs and bullets and hate and hurt and guilt. That's where I want to go. That's where you want to go, to be in such a beautiful communion with that. What did Jesus say? I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So let's, let's real quick, because I know I'm a little bit late. Eight five. Coming thus unto me, these great souls. Now, that's when you come into yourself. These great souls go no more to the misery and death of earthly life, for they have gained perfection. That's the great cycle. Where one attains to the, to the perfection of consciousness, becomes one with the Christ. But religion's in the way. It's in the way. Doctrines and rituals are in the way. And Hare Krishna, didn't Hare Krishna says you've got to gain perfection? But we've got to check with the Bible because Krishna is a Hindu. And after all, he'll able to get you in a cult. We've got to check. Let's see. Let's go into the Bible and see what the Bible The Word of God. Let's see what the Word of God says. Okay. Go to page 979. Page 979. I heard that. <laughs> That's great, though. Isn't it? Are you with me? Okay. Page 979, Hebrews chapter 6. You with me? Verse 1, let's read what Paul says. 
Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And what's he saying you've got to stop doing? No more repentance from dead works. No more having faith towards God. You shouldn't have faith towards God because you are God. You're not that faith that you are. You are. Pinch yourself. Go ahead. I wanted to see. The only one here would really do it is Mike. You know? <laughs> what else you got to give up? Look at the next line, folks. Baptisms. Laying on of hands. Resurrection of the dead. Eternal judgment. Get rid of all that stuff. You don't believe in that stuff. You exist now in the oneness of God. Perfection, see? All of the things that religion thrives on, Paul and Krishna say, stop, get away from it. And it says in 80, verse 5 of Krishna, they go no more to the misery and death of eternal life, for they have gained perfection. <laughs> when you overcome that which is the lower mind, through meditation, and you can only do this by sitting in meditation, and I don't care what kind of thought, and I don't care how stupid it sounds, and it doesn't make any sense. Listen, how stupid is it? Like, take a look at the religion outside. I mean, how stupid is this? They've had you believe in all your life there was a guy that got on a boat with all kinds of animals and, and, they, and, and then they'd come out on, and everybody's looking for the boat. Every two animals of every kind in the world. And you didn't think that was stupid. They had, they had you believe in that there was a lady, a naked lady in this orchard and a snake came up and spoke to her and she ate an apple and the whole world got screwed up and she didn't then run around looking for fig leaves. because Oh my goodness gracious, what happened? <laughs> and you believed it. Oh, that's not stupid. That sounds reasonable to me. Hey, Bo, they had you believing that a whale swallowed a guy, and the guy sat in his intestines for three days. And then the whale puked, and an evangelist came out. And, and, and you believed it. Oh, I think that's right. I believe this. That's the word of God. <laughs> but... When we talk about sitting in the magnificence of that inner spirit of yourself and entering within to go no more out. Don't you understand? This is all mythology. Don't you understand? The book was written. Each of those stories. Do you know what Adam and Eve is? The word Adam is a play on the word Adam, A-T-O-M. It's the center, the nucleus of the universe. When God took a rib out of Adam to make, you know what you do to make energy with an atom? You take an electron out of it. You know what God was saying in the Bible? All energy and life came from the splitting of the atom. Not by taking the rib out of a man to make her. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Do you know what it is when you take two of everything? You take all of the dualities of your consciousness into the ark, which is within, and you look up in the ark, there's only one window in that ark, and that's in the ceiling. You can only look up, and when you stay inside of the ark of meditation, the storms that try to destroy you actually are used to lift you up and place you on the mountaintop. That's what it means. It's real. These are myth mythology means that these are stories that are used so that you can find a deep, mystical, spiritual, psychological meaning for your life. They're important to you. And Jonah in the fish, it means that when you are cast overboard, that is the only time when you can be swallowed by that, which is the personality of God. Because as long as you're on the boat, you're paddling your own canoe, and nobody can get in your way. But when you're dumped overboard and you're floundering and you can't paddle it anymore, that's when he can swallow you up. And the number three means new life and that impact of being swallowed up by that which is the deep personality of God within you. And then you are spewed forth a new and revitalized person. That's what it means. That's nothing I mean with this. Silliness. And so when you hear that he will not have to come back, let me show it to you in the Bible and then I promise you I'm, I'm done. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, or page 1004. And I'll show you the same. What did Krishna say? Krishna says, coming to me, these great souls go no more to the misery and death of earthly life, for they have gained perfection. Look at Revelation chapter 3, and now look at verse 12. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. See? Do you see that everything I've shown you that Krishna has said this morning, the Bible has said the same thing. And then finally in 86, the worlds with the whole realm of creation come and go, but oh, Arjuna, who comes to me? For him there is no rebirth. Ah! Did you hear what he just said? Mm -hmm. Being born again is not a good thing, is it? Do you know it's not? Do you know that everybody says, I'm born again. Do you know that's not a good thing? Do you know that the only ones that Jesus told how to be born again were religious people? 
He saw this guy Nicodemus coming up with all of his robes and all of his staff and all of his Bibles. He had Bibles big enough to choke a mule. And he comes up and he says to Jesus, what do I have to do, kind sir? And Jesus says, oh, for cock with you. The only thing to do with you is get you born again and start it all up. <laughs> And that's what he meant. <laughs> that's what he meant. Ain't no way you're ever going to make it this time around because you got all of this junk in here. <laughs> but once you get it, once you get it. <laughs> and, 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 and a lot of people say, well, I don't think he meant that. I think Jesus was speaking of spiritual things when he said you must be born again. Let me show you what you, let's go to the man, the, the promise the last question, but let's go to the man himself and look at his word. Go to page 866, when Jesus told this guy, you must be born again. And was he talking about spiritual things? Look what Jesus said. And I say he's talking about reincarnation, and I can prove it by the words of Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 3, okay, and if you go, John chapter 3, after he tells him you must be born again, in verse 12, what has Jesus said? If I have told you earthly things and you don't believe it, how shall I believe if I tell you heavenly things? You must be born again until you catch on to it and understand it. You're going to come back and come back and come back until you get it right. And that's the magnificent thing. Nobody's going to get screwed up. Eventually, everybody's going to get it. Nobody's going to go down the tube. And it's got to be that way because, you know, you know, my mind sometimes thinks crazy things. I can't, I know you don't, but I mean, I do. And I didn't ask for this. Did I check in before I slid out on that tray in this hospital somewhere and say, uh, I'd like to have a crazy mind, please. A little sexy, you know. Eh? It just was there. I don't know what it is. It just happened that way. So it's no blame me. And in the same way, we're learning in the culture today that people who we may not particularly agree with do not necessarily ask to be the way they are. We better learn to come together and to understand this, glorify the Spirit of God who is within us, and come into a oneness and live in the new beauty of this new age of Aquarius. Thank you very much for sharing this time with the Bhagavad Gita.